Long-term studies, uh, ecological studies, are not simply advantageous for addressing certain behavioral questions. They're absolutely essential for understanding how an animal copes with life, understanding the factors that shape its evolution, especially the environmental ones, and why the animal actually looks the way it does and behaves the way it does. You can't answer those questions without a long-term study. This is vital. Now, let me emphasize here that with the elephant seal, I'm interested in the elephant seal, but my interest throughout the years has been in determining general principles of behavior and biology using the elephant seal, okay? Now, I want to highlight a few findings, time is limited, uh, over, uh, that we have discovered over these years. And I'm going to emphasize a few discoveries having to do with survival and with reproduction, because these are the processes that are most important uh, for natural selection. Uh, nature selects, after all, individuals that produce progeny. I will use the term we, and I do this to emphasize that this was always a team effort. Uh, over 30 or 40 graduate students were certainly involved over the years, hundreds of undergraduates, and scores of colleagues and collaborators. You can't get a job done on a big animal like this uh, working by yourself. Okay, first let me get you, give you a little context. To understand sur the survival and the, the reproductive process, one needs to know the context in which the animals are living, and ideally one wants to track individuals to really get down to the bottom of things. Okay, population history to begin with. I've already alluded to the fact that northern elephant seals were decimated by sealers in the early part of the 19th century, and they have been recovering uh, from this decimation since the nadir of the population in 1890. So the small herd that survived on this remote oceanic island in Baja California, Mexico called Guadalupe Island uh, grew slowly at first, as you'd expect, and then it started to breed in Southern California during the 1930s, and a couple of decades later reached uh, uh, Central California. Now, I'm going to emphasize two simple methods that we have used through the years that are integral for monitoring colony status and for providing vital background information on all the studies that followed. This is, I can't overemphasize how important this is. One is systematic censusing, and that implies that you've got to be able to actually see them, unlike with whales where the body's below the water. With seals, you can actually see them and count them. And number two, identification of individuals through tagging, tag recovery, and body marking. So using these simple procedures over four decades, we documented a number of things. First of all, the development of the Año Nuevo colony from its inception in 1961. And this early work was done by Tom Poulter and his colleagues at Stanford Research Institute. We come in right here about 1968. The colony's just getting started. This is a typical sigmoid growth curve, uh, slow at first, exponential, and then uh, reaching an asymptote sometime around the mid-1990s. Now the point here is that we have studied the, uh, the, the, this colony especially since its inception through the expansion phase to maturity. We studied animals during all of these phases. That's good. And we knew where the colony was, what it was doing in relation to the population. That's good too. Um, okay. Uh, here are a few things that we were able to determine that, uh, that are also important. Dispersal and colonization. We knew because we were tagging animals in Mexico in the late 60s that the settlers from Mexico dispersed and settled in the Channel Islands. 
particularly San Miguel and San Nicolas. We knew because we tagged animals at San Miguel and San Nicolas that uh, animals from those islands were the colonizers at Año Nuevo. We knew that Año Nuevo seals immigrated and colonized the Farallon Islands in 1972, the mainland in Año Nuevo in 1975, Point Reyes in 1981, and Oregon a few years later. We knew what the colony composition was, the ratio of males to females to juveniles, by and how they used the island by time of year. Uh, a very important uh, uh, variable for studying life history, age at primaparity, when a female, all the reproduction goes through the female, when does the female start, what is the age at primaparity. We were able to determine that, and we also showed that as the colony grew and it got crowded, more competitive, the age at primaparity was pushed back later in life, which is of course predicted by ecological theory. Growth and development, how long, do, how long does it take to grow to a certain age, when do they reach puberty, when do they die, we were able to determine that with marked animals. And finally, life history tables, um, survival to age in by sex and so forth. The point here is that identification of individuals permitted detailed study of vital life history parameters, and this is an important prelude to the study of the process of mortality and reproduction, which is what really, a survival selection, sexual selection, which is what really shapes a species and uh, what they become and what they look like. Okay, let's get into survival, the first thing. If you're gonna breed, you gotta survive first. And uh, this means you've gotta avoid predators and you've gotta acquire food for body maintenance and development. Well. What uh, several questions might be, when is death most likely for any species? Uh, what is the probability of surviving early development to adulthood? Do the sexes differ? Uh, of course, what are the causes of mortality? What are the optimal strategies for survival? Let me treat juveniles first of all. We learned from monitoring uh, marked, marked uh, tagged pups, uh, tagged them at weaning, over a, a two decade period, that mortality is highest during the first year of life. On average, 63% of the pups that are born in a given year will die before reaching age one. The, the, the ax really falls during the first year of life. One third of those pups will die on the rookery before being weaned. The majority, two-thirds of the pups, will die when they go to sea for the first time to feed on their own later in the year. The survivorship can range from 50% uh, in a good year. That's a really good year if 50% live to age one. But in a bad year, like uh, the El Nino year of 1983, the survival was only 20%. The obverse, the mortality was 80%, can be very, very high. On average, about 16 of 100 pups born survive to age four, which is about the end of the juvenile period, more or less, for males and females. Interestingly, uh, there is not a, a high and positive relationship between mass at weaning and survival to age one and two, which Joanne Ryder and Pat Morris, who are here, uh, were involved in this study. Looking at it another way, the fattest are not the fittest, at least to age one and two. Maybe later in life, maybe being fat early on is good for reproduction, but not for surviving those first two years in life. Okay, the point of this is that the most important hurdle for elephant seals is surviving that first year. If I were an elephant seal consultant, I would walk into their office and say, I would advise pups on the rookery to stay close to mom and to avoid other mothers and rampaging males because they are the cause of virtually all of the pup mortality on the, ro on the rookery before weaning. Uh, pups are bitten by other mothers who are protecting their own milk supply. They don't want any other pups stealing it from them. And rampaging males in their effort to copulate with everything and to avoid being beaten up by a stronger male will simply uh, roll directly over pups, uh, squashing them to death. At sea, 
As another matter, uh, I would have much less to advise on that score. Uh, obviously, find food, uh, despite the fact that you're naive and you don't know what it looks like and no one's teaching what to do. Uh, and avoid predators, which you don't know a thing about. <laughs> there are orca, orca, the killer whales out there, and white sharks, and these poor little naive beasts don't know a thing about them. I guess they have to learn by trial and error. Cause of death, then, at sea is still a big mystery. We're working on that. We'll solve it in the next 40 years, probably. OK, what are the odds of surviving to breed? Um, uh, Joanne Ryder and I uh, monitored a, a large sample of male pups that were tagged by the Poulter Group during the mid-1960s, when we first started working. And then a large sample of female pups born in 1973 and 1974. And then what we did was we followed these animals throughout their lives. They were permanently marked. We marked them behaviorally as well on the body. And we followed them through their lives to determine the adult survival rate. And a little bit later, I'll tell you about the reproductive rate. What did we find? 14% of these males survived to puberty. Puberty is age five in the male. A little fewer, 12%, survived to the earliest mating age. In this sample, it was age six. One male mated one, one six-year-old mated one time, and that was it. But only 5% survived to peak breeding age, which is age 10 or 11. All of them were dead by age 14. That's maximum lifetime for the male. Females uh, did much better. 35% survived to breeding age, but breeding age is earlier. Age parity is three years in the female. Some females live to 20 years of age. So the point here, few survive to breeding age. Uh, more females survive to breeding age than males, in large part because they start earlier. Females live longer than males, and so they have more years to breed than males. Now to reproduction, the good part, Gary. Uh, Using uh, the same sample that I described for survival, we um, followed these marked individuals. Uh, and, and what we did was to measure and estimate lifetime reproductive success. Now, if you can measure one variable, the creator said, you've got one. What is it going to be? That's the one you want to measure. Because more than anything else, this is really what shapes an animal and what it is, what it looks like, how it behaves, its whole biology. Reproductive success, don't forget it. Now this has been done well in relatively few species because it's difficult to do. Let me tell you what we found. Okay, of that sample, and now I'm talking about males, 6% mated. The, the, those that mated were actually less than half of the number that survived to mating age. And just to give you some absolute numbers here, absolute numbers, eight males actually sired 348 pups by our estimation. Now they fell into three categories. There were the highly successful males, the moderately successful males, the low successful males. Three males uh, mated uh, in order. One male mated with 121 females, one with 97, one with 63 females. They did very well. Three males, one mated with 22 females, one with 20 females, and one with 17. And in the low mating group, two mated with less than five females apiece. Eleven survivors failed to breed completely. And I'll tell you the one sad story of this one male who lives his whole life to age 14 and dies attempts to mate, but we never see him mate at all. So just surviving is not enough. You've still got work to do. <laughs> Males of age 8 to 12 obviously dominated mating, with 11, year, uh, age 11 being the peak years. Now let me give you a little bit of an aside here. Over the years, independent of this study, we observed one male dominate breeding for as long as four years in a row. We estimate that this male inseminated over 300 females in his lifetime. I used to always tell my class, this male is guaranteed to be in the Elephant Seal Hall of Fame. OK, uh, let's go to females. Uh, females did better. 33% of the sample mated. Uh, all of the survivors to uh, earliest breeding age actually had pups, every single one of them.
But 8% of them did not succeed in weaning their pups. Some females produced 12 plus pups. I say 12 plus because the study ended uh, and there were still a few females living long. Uh, the cap would have to be 17 here, given what we know. So that's the best females did. Age at first birth for the sample was age 3, 4, or 5. Weaning success increased with age up to age 6. That is to say, the females giving birth for the first time at age 3 didn't do a very good job of it. The 4-year-olds did a little better job of it. 5 years old, getting pretty good. And by the time they got to age 6, they knew what they were doing. Experience was a great help here, and they got much better at it. So, okay. Only a few, few males were successful. Only a very few males were successful, but a few individuals were extremely successful. Uh, these males won fights, and they achieved high social rank, and this gave them access to females. They were able to monopolize a number of females. It's simply a power struggle, plain and simple. And they were able to do this for two or three continuous uh, years running. The traits they possessed were clearly under intense selection pressure. Females, in contrast, no female achieved the reproductive success of the most successful males. Well, of course not, because reproductive potential of the male, as we saw, is perhaps as much as 300 pups in a lifetime, maybe even more, compared to a cap of 17 in the life of the very best female. Successful females gave birth early in life, they gave birth every year of life, they lived long, and they nurtured and protected their pups uh, to weaning age. These data reveal that elephant seals are one of the most polygynous of mammals. By that I mean a few males mate with a great number of females, and there's no parental care by the males whatsoever. Uh, this is the most common mating system in, in, in mammals, in nature, so it's good to study an animal that shows that uh, to an extreme degree, and you couldn't pick a better one than the elephant seal. Okay, males and females clearly maximize their reproductive success in different ways, and this affects their behavior throughout life. That's why you find sex differences. That's why males and females are different. Males basically in this species, an extreme animal, adopt a high-risk, high-gain strategy. Females adopt a low-risk, low-gain strategy. I like to give, give a slot machine analogy to drive this point home. Males play a slot machine that yields a jackpot or nothing. You either win big or you strike out completely. So it's not surprising that you gamble in a life to belong to this exclusive breeding club because if you don't gamble, you're not going to make it. In contrast, females play machines you know slot machines with lots of cherries. They win reliably, they win often, but they never win very much. But it's steady and it's safe. Now you see these strategies being played out in other aspects of life, not surprisingly. Let me give you an example. Milk stealing. The pup is weaned, mom leaves, she goes to see. Some pups try to get back into the harem females to steal milk from mothers that are not their own. It's very dangerous. You lose your eye, you lose your life. Males, 10 to 1, do this much more often than females. They are much more persistent at it. If rebuffed, the male goes back in, the female quits, she, she, get, she, she quits. And there's good reason for this. There's a high payoff for a male. The size at weaning is related to the size in adulthood. The size in adulthood in a male is related to his fighting status, which is related to his breeding success. You don't have that same kind of arrangement in a female. It, it would be ridiculous for the female to try this because the gain is not proportional. Uh, males also take more risks to breed and to feed, as I may have time to show you later on. So it's, this fits. Another aside, let me just say this before leaving reproduction, that recent paternity studies with southern elephant seals, a closely related congener, confirm that males that dominate mating sire most of the pups. That is to say, there is a high and positive relationship between mating success, who's copulating, and paternity, as determined by DNA fingerprinting and genetic uh, methods.
Okay, feeding now. Finding food serves survival as well as sex. Uh, that is to say, accruing resources serves body maintenance and development. You've got to do that to get big and to, and to get to a breeding age. And it also enhances breeding success, particularly in males. As I said, large males prevail in fighting, and this is directly related to uh, breeding success. Well, um, back to instruments. Again, methods are what leads to uh, discovery here, as well as in astronomy, I suppose. And if uh, we live in the age of nanotechnology, I guess this would be a demonstration of macro technology. Uh, we have deployed a variety of instruments on these animals uh, over the years. Uh, diving instruments, geolocation sensors, satellite tags, cameras, you name it. On well over 200 adults since 1983 when we first started doing this. We've done this primarily to determine uh, where these animals go to feed and how they do it. Um, now, from the outset, you would expect sex differences here. Why? Well, because males outweigh females by three to ten times. So, males have, what, how do males achieve this great mass relative to females, and how do they maintain that difference? Let me just say that adult males spend two foraging trips for year, per year at sea, lasting, each one lasting about five months. And these tracks, uh, here in red um, show that the males migrate from Año Nuevo north along the coast uh, to what we call focal foraging areas, these yellow circles, uh, and those focal foraging areas range from uh, Oregon, Washington, uh, Puget Sound area, Canada, southern Alaska, all the way to the western Aleutians here and then they zip on back. Now let me just say this, when the males are going up to those foraging areas, they are uh, transiting very quickly, they don't stop. And they don't stop until they arrive at each one, uh, at one of these. Each one of these represents a different male, I should say that. Each one has his own focal foraging area. When a male reaches that area, he then stops and he feeds from anywhere from one to three months, depending on how far away it is from the starting spot. Uh, having done that, they then come back home, they breed or they molt, and then they do this one more time. Now, um, the diving pattern of males suggests that they are feeding on benthic prey, bottom-dwelling prey such as skates, rays, ratfish, small sharks, and hagfish. They either move along the bottom in search of prey or they adopt a sit and wait strategy where the prey comes to them and they just grab it. The prime foraging area is the area that is furthest away from Año Nuevo, right here in the Aleutians. Why do I say that? Because we weigh these animals before they leave and we weigh them when they come back. And what we find is that the mass gain per day per unit body weight is uh, considerably more here than it is for uh, these other areas, indeed, what you have is a climb. The further away it is, the better the foraging uh, for the males. Now, let, another aside, we have a study in progress I might mention, I'm still working a bit at this, that takes this question further. I guess you can phrase the question this way. Does the location of the feeding grounds here set limits on the location of the, feed, the, the breeding grounds? Now the breeding grounds I'm talking about is Año Nuevo with this sample. Uh, but what about elephant seals from Mexico? Uh, remember I talked about Guadalupe Island, the mother colony? It's down here, a little bit off the map. It's 1,100 kilometers south of Año Nuevo. Um, what do they do? Uh, if you calculate how long it takes them to get here, it takes them nine and a half days longer to get here than it takes a male from Año Nuevo. It takes them nine and a half days longer to get back uh, than males from Año Nuevo. They're doing this twice a year. As a result, they have half the amount of time to spend feeding there than males from Año Nuevo. How do they cope? Why don't you think about this for a minute and maybe we can come back to this and question and answer and I can update you on it. Okay, let me talk about females, equal time here. These are all female tracks. 
The red tracks are uh, tracks during the eight month period that the female is at sea when she's pregnant. She's gestating throughout that period at sea. She's feeding. The yellow tracks are during a two month period when she's recovering from breeding. And then they both uh, come home. Now what you'll notice here is that females use a large area of the northeastern Pacific. And typically what a female does is she travels, she reaches a patch of food, she feeds for uh, two or three days, she, then she leaves that patch, finds another patch, and feeds there, and then moves somewhere else. So it's stop and go, stop and go, stop and go. It's not a specific place. We get the impression that females are feeding in the water column on a variety of species of uh, squid. And, and the, their prey, the female's prey, is moving up and down with available light in the, what's called the deep scattering layer. That is to say, the prey are uh, closer to the surface at night and f deeper down during the day. And the diving pattern of the elephant seal exactly corresponds to that. Okay, then l let me summarize. Males have less time at sea to feed, but they appear to feed on uh, more nutritious or more energy-dense prey. Uh, and they have to do something different than what females are doing. As I said at the outset, they have to get more energy. But feeding along the coast, where they do, suggests that they take greater risk of being exposed to near-surface near predators like white sharks and killer whales. Females are in a relatively safe area in the open ocean, and I would simply say that this fits with what you'd expect of the, uh, the dictates of the reproductive strategy, if you will, which are in part driven by the, uh, uh, the size differences, as I said. Now, let me give you one last example to illustrate the benefits of a long-term study. Elephant seals separate feeding from sex and pup provisioning. Both sexes feed enough when they're at sea to lay down a blubber layer that provides energy during the long stays on land to breed and to molt. Both sexes are fasting while they're breeding. Males are fasting for over 100 days during the breeding season. Females are actually fasting while they're lactating. And you, you all know, I'm sure, how expensive lactation is. So, you have a situation where the only source of food for pups prior to weaning is mother's milk. So a, a pup's weaning weight reflects how well the mother did at foraging during her eight months of pregnancy at sea. And generally, this reflects the environmental con conditions in the ocean at that time insofar as they affected the elephant seal's prey. For example, something like climate change might be a variable of importance there. Okay, method. Um, we have weighed approximately 100 to 200 pups every year, wean pups, uh, since 1980. And uh, here I present the uh, data for both sexes combined. Now I'm asking you now to consider three scenarios. Imagine that you're doing a study. If you had performed an eight-year study from about 1986 to 1993, right in here, or if you had performed a four-year study from uh, 2001 to 2005, what you would have found is uh, a mean weaning weight of 128 kilograms, plus or minus something or other. You would not have observed any systematic changes from year to year. You would say that's what it is. It doesn't change from year to year. Scenario one. Scenario two, you're taking a longer look. You're going to look at 19 years of data from 1980 to 1999, right here. What you then find, and that's indicated by the solid line, is a rather precipitous, uh, continuous decrease in weaning weight from a high of about 142 kilograms in 1980 to a low of 116 kilograms in 1999. This is a decrease of 1.3 kilograms per year. It's about three pounds per year. It's highly significant. And it's, it's cause for alarm. What's going on? Okay, the third scenario is this. You're looking at the whole package now, 23 years of data. Well, that's the curve here. Uh, not only do you see this uh, precipitous decline, but you see a recovery in the last four years. 
So the moral, I think, is that a, the long look gives you a bigger picture, I think a better picture, and I think a more accurate picture of, of what's going on. And then you can start to actually compare that to other data. Clearly what this suggests is something was happening at sea during the two decades from 1980 to 1999. It suggests that females had an increasingly difficult time accruing resources during that period. We know that during an El Nino year, elephant seal females have a much more difficult time. That's another story. Well, okay, they had a difficult time. Now you have to look at a different data set. Chavez from uh, Monterey Bay Aquarium published an article, an int interesting article, uh, early in the year, I guess it was, uh, in which they describe a change in the Pacific in the mid-1970s from what they call a cool anchovy reg regime, where anchovy, anchovies are high, to what they call a sardine regime, where anchovies are low and, and uh, sardines effloresce. So uh, what we're looking at here from 1980 to 1999 is the sardine regime in their terms. And then at the end, the anchovy regime kicks in again. Now, I'm not implying that elephant seals are eating sardines or eating anchovies, but rather that their prey vary with these large-scale, naturally occurring variations. But clearly, the sardine regime is not good for elephant seals. It's not good for salmon either, nor uh, seabirds in California, Washington, and Oregon, and possibly many other animals that we haven't really looked at very carefully yet. And I guess the conclusion is that clearly these processes must be considered when talking about human-induced climate change uh, and the management of ocean living resources. And I guess my, my big point here is that it takes a long time to actually discern these things going on. In the case of what I've just described, it's taken 23 years, and that's probably a minimum. We might get a, a very different look if we keep doing this for another 10, 20, or whatever, geological time in the ultimate. It took 14 to 20 years to actually determine reproductive success in this animal, uh, in the males and in the females. And then there are infrequently occurring events that are very important, but because they're infrequent, uh, you have to spend a long time before you actually, these things rear their ugly head. Let me give you an example. Conrad Lorenz, way back in the 1960s, won a Nobel Prize, and he said, and I can't affect the German accent, but males um, do not kill other males in fighting. He's talking about animals in general. He says, because it would be bad for the species. Now, Conrad, bless his heart, was wrong both on theoretical grounds as well as on empirical grounds. We, uh, other people have seen this. In the case of elephant seals, we had, it took 20 years, but we actually confirmed that a male fighting another male for, to dominate a harem of females uh, killed the other one. And these were two top-ranked males. Killed him on the spot, there he is right down there. And uh, we actually saw that again a couple of other times. But we had to look for about 20 years before we could see this. One other thing that happens is that females are inadvertently killed by males, I think it's inadvertent, uh, during mating attempts. And we went on for about 20 years before we could confirm that for a fact. Then we started looking very carefully and we were able to document this. It's not an unusual thing in many other animals as well. But these things are difficult to document in nature unless you're doing a long-term study. I went to the skull exhibit at the California Academy of Science two days ago and saw this wonderful collection. I met Ray Bandar, who is the ultimate uh, bone collector. And he tells me that he's collected something like over 6,000 marine mammal skulls during the last 50 years. And it wasn't until last year that he finally collected the skull of a doll porpoise, which is not an, un, an uncommon animal by any means. But here again, just putting in the time sometimes pays off. So if long-term studies are so good, why isn't everyone out there doing them? Well, it's not so easy. There are a number of rather basic requirements. I'll just go through this list rather quickly. Ideally, you'd like to be able to identify the individuals for life. 
You'd like to be working with short-lived animals, but animals that is to say relative to your own life, so you can look at them throughout life. You want to be able to weigh them, measure them, sample them for blood, tissue, whatever, uh, capture, transport them, and believe it or not, we can capture and transport uh, elephant seals. We, we use the young ones. Uh, you want them to be robust against disturbance. The big difference between elephant seals and sea lions, you do something on a sea lion, they all run into the ocean. Move away. Uh, elephant seals don't do this. This is a great asset. You want to be able to monitor the population, especially pup production. You want to be able to determine survival to various ages. You want to observe who reproduces and why, what enables them to do that. Perhaps most important here is you want ready access to the colony. It's got to be cheap and expensive, and you get, when you get there, you want amenities. Uh, so that you can do this for a long time, okay? It's got to be comfortable. And although it is not up there, uh, I would add that uh, you should also have a good question uh, that is going to impress your colleagues on the NSF panels uh, who are going to give you operating money. And let me remind you that you must continue to come up with new questions every three or four years to maintain continuous funding, which is the most, one of the most difficult things to do in science, as you all know. So you must learn how to juggle, most important. Um, I just think I'll end with this, that subject and location. The, the, the animal subject you pick is very important and the location that you pick relative to that subject is most important. Uh, the local elephant seals with their proximity to my comfortable office at UCSC are a model for a long-term study and have been very good to us. Let me, let me just contrast this. If I were studying almost any other pinniped, seal or sea lion, most of them, after all, live in the Arctic or the Antarctic. You have to mount an expedition to do this. Not have to mount an expedition every, every year for 20 or 30 years is, is very difficult to do. So if I've done one smart thing in my career, it was to choose the right animal and choose the location I'm in right now. Thank you very much.